so this third video has been difficult because I thought it was already done. I thought I'd done everything. I thought all I had to do was um, record an opening. But I've, I'm going to have to redo my conclusion because the conclusion was based on what I thought she was asking for. Which was asking, what are you for? So I told her. So that's what my conclusion was. My conclusion was also very positive because it was talking about communication. That communication would be good. We do need lines of communication eventually. However, I've looked at it again. Her frustration with everyone is they didn't respond the way she wanted. They didn't respond to the question she thought she was asking. What's the interesting thing when you look at the way people communicate? Because, well, it's not only what, there's, there's what they, they mean. What they say, what is heard, and then what is interpreted. I don't think she said what she meant. And then I don't think we heard what she said. I think she was actually asking. Yeah, tell us about the bits of feminism you like. <laughs> I think that's what it was. Stop talking about the bits of feminism you don't like. Stop talking about the bits of feminism you like. I think that's what she was saying. So what advocacy for women do you want to do? So I'm not sure if I'm going to use the conclusion I recorded this morning in response to that question. Or if it was a bit angry. <laughs> As you can imagine. <laughs> when you suddenly twig that what you've been asked is, I want to know what you want to do for women. <laughs> <laughs> what you're actually going to get is you're going to get both conclusions. You're going to get the really calm one. In which I'm nice. Then the angry one. It's just my anger. Might as well see it. Another thing. Mountain Monday this week. I'm not going to do anything on that. Jesus has gone forever. I don't know if she's seen the previous video. I don't even remember. It was quite boring. Um, but she, what she did notice in Mountain Monday was she said. I'm not trying to convert anyone to feminism. And I thought, did she, did she actually watch my video then? Because that's what my, my last video, the prologue was. That's what it was kind of implying, was that she was trying to convert to feminism. She says, I'm not trying to convert anyone to feminism, you know. But you know, you don't need to. As a religion, being a feminist is being part of the priest class. But the rest of us are lay feminists. We, we're still preached to by feminists and we still believe what they preach. Well, unless you're red pill. Anyone not red pill believes what they preach. You don't really have to go to university or college to learn patriarchy theory. You don't have to do sociology to learn patriarchy theory. Do you know when we talk about patriarchy theory? We talked about it when we were about six years old. It was in the history books. That's how history was written. It was established we need to get women in history recognised, women's contribution in history was recognised. And this didn't mean picking out the women that were achievers, which of course there aren't very many on. And women's achievements tend to be invisible. And that's not that's not me being feminist, that is just the nature of it, because the power of the domestic sphere is, does not make history in the way that the power of the physical sphere does. So it's um Women that are exceptional, that, that are achievers in history, although there are a few. The way that women are being put in the history books is through every chapter in a history book for kids, they'll be saying how women suffered in that age and how women were treated badly in that age. So that's, that's our first introduction. Our first introduction to patriarchy theory isn't as this is a feminist theory, it's this is historical fact. That's how we first introduced to it. So, we're all lay feminists because we live in a culture in which feminism is the prevailing religion. So she doesn't want to make everyone identify as feminists. It doesn't matter if you identify as a feminist or not. If you believe what the feminists preach, you don't have to be a feminist. I, st I, I stopped being a feminist in 1993. 1993, I decided, you know, 
It really makes no sense for a man to call himself a feminist. Some of my arguments for not calling himself a rare feminist actually came from the radical feminists. Um, I said, look, I'm a man. I don't know what women want. So I can, I be, why have I got a right to, to be demanding things that women want when I don't know what women want? I don't think I have the authority to be a feminist. Secondly, I don't think I'll be taken as being sincere if I claim I'm a feminist. I think it'd be assumed that I'm just saying I'm a feminist to um, get my end away. And um, thirdly, I've got a problem with my own sort out. I think that was probably, it's probably the sort of um, inceptive seed of being a sort of proto MRA at that point was saying, I've got my problem with my own sort out. And actually, some of my proto men's rights activism did probably help them in the 1990s because um, I came up with the term white knight then. I'm not saying I personally came up with the term white knight and claimed, well, that was me, that was. But I did. I, I, I was trying to inadvertently and accidentally. I was, um, there is actually a white knight syndrome that is in psychology anyway. But just the general thing of you see somebody behaving in a certain way and you attribute an archetype to it. And when I saw men that were defending women, whether they were right or wrong, I, I said, they're white knights. This guy's a white knight. And I also discovered misandry. I discovered the word misandry. I um, postulated its existence because I felt it needed to be said that there were certain feminists that were misandrous. Certain feminists. You see where I was. I was in that situation where not all feminists. I was in that period of my life. Um, there were certain feminists that were definitely misandrous. And to distinguish them from the ones that weren't, I felt there was the uneasy an adjective. And I thought about it. I thought, well, misogynist comes from gynae, same as gynecology and all that. And I, and I knew the Greek for man was andro. So I looked up in the dictionary and there it was, misandrous. And then, shortly after that, I saw an article in the Cosmo. And a girlfriend. You have a girlfriend, you read Cosmo, it's there, isn't it? You pick it up, have a flick through Cosmo. I was looking through Cosmo, and there was an article by some woman who was saying, um, and we have this word misogynist, we don't have the equivalent for man. I don't have the equivalent for hating men. I thought, you only have to look up in the dictionary. That took me about a quarter of an hour to sort out that problem. And you've actually written this whole article having not taken that effort to go, if there was such a word, it'd be this. Does that exist? Yes. <laughs> That's all it would take. So much for research. How the hell did she get into journalism? And I pointed this out. My girlfriend at the time. I established the existence of the word misandry in the 90s, and I also started calling certain kinds of men white knights in the 90s. So I was kind of a proto-MRA again. But I was still pro-feminist, in the sense that I thought that while men shouldn't be feminists, I was respectful of women that were and thought that women should be. That's my opinion, it's since changed. But during that time, I was still a lay feminist, because I still believe what they told me. They were going to lie to me. I think imagine any of these statistics that were coming out were blatant lies. And because I still believed what they were saying, no matter whether I identified as a feminist or not, I was still a lay feminist. And I think she's right when she says, I don't want to convert these people to feminism. No, you don't. You just want them to be believers. You want them to be lay feminists. Anyway, hmm, let's hear what she has to say. She's going to start off by saying, that annoying woman in the office, the girl is called something sexist. Yeah, okay, stereotype the feminist, why don't you? <laughs> It's, that's a straw, straw feminist there. You create the straw feminist and said so that's the feminist that we all worried about. We're worried about the stereotypical feminist. The, yeah, anyway, let's hear the straw, straw feminist and let's see what we that annoying woman in your office who claims everything is sexist got that way through a lack of an alternative that she could access that would address her legitimate concerns. Can you remember who it is at Simon Street? Do you remember who it is that excommunicated you? It wasn't us, was it? It wasn't us that drives traffic away from you. It was 
Sarkeesian and Macintosh and all that lot. They're the ones that they extremely hate you. You're having it at your audience. You're having it at the audience that identifies as them. They're the ones that make you literally the devil. Again, I'm saying this because I'm attempting to overcome my own immediately defensive reaction when confronted by a person who claims to be anti-feminist. This, right here, is an attempt to meet people with opposing views halfway. You know, that thing that anti-feminists claim feminists don't do. So I've seen Feedback Friday now. So when she's saying, you know that thing that anti-feminists say that feminists don't do? What the thing you didn't do? <laughs> that thing. You said you're going to meet us halfway, so you're going to listen to our comments. Instead, you gave everyone a telling off and threatened them with kittens. I understand the aversion some have to feminism because I feel it whenever someone says they're an anti feminist. Yeah, I get this. Because you hear anti feminist and you think that maybe um, we want to take the votes away from women and we want um, women out of the workplace and back at home making sandwiches and all that. Um, you think that's what anti-feminist means? And, well, you think, no. Well, that's not what I want, right? Um, I think that's most in my age, right? Um, no, it's patriarchy theory. That's what it comes down to. It comes down to patriarchy theory. It comes down to the theory that society is um, being devised by men. The men have all the power in society, and um, that uh, that we have devised society for our own benefit, um, and to achieve our ends, we oppress and exploit women. It's that theory. That's what we object to. It's not the equality of women. We don't object to that. We object to that theory. Because that theory, that theory produces hatred of men. And they will. We always will. Now, um, there is some exceptions to, um, see most feminists, Depend on patriarchy theory. Most families get back to patriarchy theory. Um, there are some exceptions. And don't tell me bell hooks. Because bell hooks is not exceptional enough. Bell hooks is, is, is part of this intersectional feminism. <laughs> Sorry, I am the minority. I'm in the minority that made the majorities. I'm the one that dips out in intersectional. This is an example of why somebody like Bell Hooks, somebody who suggests Bell Hooks, oh, look at Bell Hooks, yeah, she's good, she's all right. It's an example of why she's not helping. She's not holistic enough. Um, now she's got some things in this paragraph that are right. I could probably pull stuff out of this paragraph that are right. And some things that are just so wrong. It's like, The first act of violence that patriarchy demands of males is not violence towards women. Hold on a minute. The least likely act of violence that patriarchy demands of males is violence towards women. I used to work in, um, I used to work at the London Bridge Experience and, um, one of the roles I played there was I was keeper of the, um, keeper of the heads. And uh, the keeper of the heads, he was he was working somewhere around the bridge back in the 17th century, and uh, well, actually from the 14th century to the 17th century. Um, and his job was to prepare the heads of traitors after they've been executed to go on the spikes. So there've been heads on spikes for 400 years, and. During those 400 years, only one woman's head had been on the spikes. Now, it's clearly not true that the only woman, there was only one woman executed in 400 years, because Anne Blin would have been in that time and her head wasn't displayed on the spikes. The reason you didn't display the heads of a woman on the spikes was because you wanted to deter revolution, not encourage it. 
If people are going past and looking at men on spikes, looking at that and going, oh, that could be me. If they saw a woman's head in the spike, they'd be outraged. They'd be outraged and they'd be up in arms. Because they wouldn't be thinking, that could be me. They'd be thinking, that could be somebody I care about. That's a different psychological effect, you see. When you think it could be you, it stops you, doesn't it? deters you from showing any sort of revolutionary tendencies. But if you saw a woman on there, you might be thinking, our king must be some sort of tyrant, and you'd turn against him. So, you know, no one shows off about their violence towards women. Um, it's one of the most discouraged acts of violence in society is violence against women. Instead, now this is next bit, all right? Instead, patriarchy demands, well, call it tradition. Instead, patriarchy demands of all males that they engage in acts of psychic self-mutilation. They kill off the emotional parts of themselves. Well, suppress them, that's true. If an individual is not successful in emotionally crippling himself, he can count on patriarchal men, oh really, is it just men, to enact rituals of power that will sort his self-esteem? Really, is it just men? We know it's not just men. And you're looking at, you know, your your main or your target audience is gamers, so that you know nerds and geeks and the like. We know full well that our self-esteem was not um, was not assorted purely by the ritual acts of power of other men. It wasn't just other men that ground down our self-esteem. The thing is, I'm not quoting Dawkins there. I'm not quoting one of the feminists that you consider to be one of the mad feminists. I'm quoting one that's considered to be a moderate. Uh, Bell Hooks is considered to be a moderate feminist. But that's her view of the world. Her view of the world is, is men that are violent, is men that cruel, is men who have all the power, and women are all good. I know it's, that is... <laughs> See how that reinforces traditional roles. It's your benevolent sexism right there. Wonderful women syndrome. And powerful man syndrome. I don't know what we call that. But that's kind of a benevolent sexism. It's a reverse benevolent sexism. Not that we need reverse, because sexism is sexism. But that's benevolent sexism towards men, isn't it? The idea that men are more powerful. And benevolent sex and towards women is saying that women are all good. They're two forms of benevolent sexism. And they do. It is. You can talk about it flattering into a role. Yeah, you're good. You must be the mother. Go on, you be mother because you're all good. Yeah, but we also get that when you, when you go into a room and <laughs> when you hear somebody say, Ah, a nice strong man. You know that you got some shifting to do. Particularly if you're me and you're clearly not a nice strong man. You're just a man. <laughs> you know it's to flatter you into doing some labour for them. Don't tell me about the looks. No, forget that. Cow and a crow. Cow and a crow is good. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, Karen, Karen de Crow was uh, explained her theory of how traditional gender roles came out. And explain it by power or by a story. And um, she said uh, um, when she first got married, she used to make her husband meatloaf. And she made her husband meatloaf. She cut the end of the meatloaf and put it in the oven. Um, and he asked her, Why did you do that? I said, Why well, you did? Why? I've always did that. So she asked her, Why do we cut the end of the meatloaf? In the oven. She said, I don't know, that's what my mother always did. So they asked the grandmother, why did you keep them in the mother? She said, we had a small oven. You see, the whole thing, quite a gag actually. Um, it's true, though, it's true story. She said, the whole thing is about tradition, is we just keep doing the same things without realizing we don't need to do them anymore. And that's the thing, is these, these traditional roles that we have, they were devised for a different sort of situation, a situation where um, where we needed to expand, to survive, when we had, you know, um, limited lifespans and, you know, life was harsh and medical care and all that sort of thing. 
You don't have to. You don't have to see King Jishou. Okay. Um, but it's not. It's not been the cause of oppression, or if it is the cause of oppression, it's it's been either mutual oppression or it's been an oppression. <laughs> if it is oppression, it's capitalist oppression. It's not, it's not men are oppressing women. Um. Yeah, it's not the equality. There's no objection to the equality. We're egalitarians too. It's an objection to patriarchy theory. I'm attempting to see past the label and look at the substance of the complaints. In return, I challenge anti-feminists to stop fixating on what they oppose. Surely as a feminist you're opposed to something. There must be things you're opposed to. Don't you fixate on them in order to oppose them? How do you oppose something without fixating on it? and start focusing on issues that we can agree to work on together. If you really want to dismantle radical feminism, that's the best way to do it. I'm tired of hearing about the dwork side. I'm tired of hearing about that instead of getting information on what these anti-feminists really want beyond hating on conveniently female targets. Conveniently female targets. No, I think quite frequently, um, a lot of us have agreed. Male feminists are the worst. Just in a video only a couple of weeks ago on Owen Jones. Owen Jones isn't conveniently female, is he? I'm not just attacking people that are conveniently female. Why is that convenient? Liana, I'm. How many white knights do you think they're going to be that are going to get outraged that I can speak to you like this way? I, mean, I, I know you can handle it. I know you're an adult. We're both adults. We can do this. But they're going to be going, how could you say that to Liana? Poor Liana. You're not conveniently female, Liana. You're inconveniently female. I'm having to have a rant at you. People are going to go, what a terrible man he is. I'm having a rant at Liana K. There's, there's been convenient about your opponent being female. That is quite inconvenient, quite frankly. Because if you, if you are arguing with a female, you already look like the bad person. All right, there you go. Progress is not defined by what you oppose. Progress is defined by where you want to go. Angry people exist in all movements, and they shouldn't be allowed to hijack feminism dialogue. because it's simply a piece of the larger concept that all people are created equal in the eyes of a fair society. Whatever it ends up being called, work advocating for women and girls will continue. People have been trying to stop that work for over a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah, as long as you keep calling it work advocacy for women and girls, that's fine. Don't claim that it's for everyone and then make it all about women and girls. I guess that's it's that Moss and Bailey approach I find I find objectionable. One of oh patriarchy hurts men too, we're gonna care about you and then not I genuinely think we should be doing it for ourselves. We should be men's rights should be something that men should be doing. We don't need feminist supervision on it. Um, I do object to feminists who claim that they're all about equality and then they're not going to fight for men's rights. I, I, prefer, I prefer you to say, yeah, I'm an advocate for women and girls. And that's fine. So, yeah, yeah, that's your job, that's your specialism. That's not my specialism. My specialism is, what it, it is men's rights. Right for men and boys. Where did that get us? Our current presidential candidates. Unless you really want women out of Yeah, I didn't understand that either. But then I can't think of anything to say about it either. It just seemed like a mad tangent to go off on. Out of the workforce, the ballot box, and the media, then your best tactic is to promote concepts and people you mostly agree with instead of just mocking the personalities you oppose. Just saying a viewpoint is stupid isn't enough unless you can provide facts that contradict that viewpoint. And it's like you don't even know what we do. We have loads of facts, Yana. We have loads of facts. We're always delivering facts. That's what upsets the feminists. That's what they feel as harassment. Because we keep delivering facts. Just, you know, basic statistics like the fact that, you know, one in three domestic abuse victims are male. Which is actually 
people in more conservative estimates. Some of them has it at 40%, some has it at 50%. Um, one actually not particularly surprising statistic when you should think about it is 75% um, of non-reciprocated violence is initiated by women. But then, of course, when you think about what non-reciprocated violence actually means, you mean violence in which the um, other partner hasn't retaliated. So you kind of think, oh yeah, that makes sense. Men would restrain themselves from retaliating, whereas a woman's got no cause to restrain herself from retaliating, actually. But yeah, we're always delivering facts. That's what we do. <laughs> that is 99% of what we do. Or we used to. And we used to, we used to go into a lot of the comment threads on articles that were vaguely on men's rights issues. Um, and then we'd argue with feminists in the comment thread and, um, give them links to all the facts that we knew. And a lot of new sites put an end to that sort of thing. Because, as far as they're concerned, the uh, the comment threads were filling up with um, with men's rights activists and feminists all bickering. But yeah, we were using facts, and they were quite often using um, arguments like Motton Bailey's and language policing and stuff to try and prevent us having a discussion. Anti-feminists in general don't do a good job outlining the harm a line like Kill All Men does. They don't point out that men are killing themselves in frighteningly large numbers. And that I, don't know if you can, I, I don't know if you're conflating anti-feminists with men's rights activists. Of course, there's an overlap in the intersection between men's rights activists and anti-feminists. Men's rights activists definitely draw attention to the male suicide issue. Definitely do. Some of our big talking points. Um, I started in the 22 push up challenge for a little bit until I realised it was incentivizing the military, and I switched to um, promoting calm instead. Because calm is, uh, it, it, it deals with all male suicides, not just veteran male suicides. Because um, veteran male suicides isn't that much different to civilian, it's not a huge difference. Dentists are the most likely profession to commit suicide. And I felt the idea that maybe making veterans the deserving depressed was, or the deserving, the deserving suicidal was actually incentivizing, incentivizing the military in a strange way. And in fact, we should be making sure that all men Regardless of their career choices, um, should be should have their suicide risks taken seriously. Particularly, one of the major causes of suicide is divorce. Divorce is more likely to cause suicide than um, a military career. And may even contribute to the better than suicide because of divorce. Um, this is complicated. It's very complicated. But anyway, if, if um, I'm going to be reiterating things that I've said, but as the sound quality is a bit on this video, probably from that video, I'll be able to reiterate it because I probably won't be able to sit through it. Um, the military incentivizes marriage in order to attract men in the military. So they recruit boys when they're quite young, and then they sign on for four years or whatever, and during those four years, they make sure they get married. Or, or at least they incentivize them getting married because if you get married, you get to move out of the barracks. Well, as soon as you're married, you need to have an income. So, what appeared to be a glamorous job now becomes a class seller job, the job you need to do for, for the um, economic um, necessity. And while you're in the military, um, which is a big strain on marriage, of course, you, know, you have long periods away from home, and, um, even the training. I would say even the training, even the training gives you mental health issues. Um, it was a great strain on the marriage, and at the same time, it encouraged you to stay married, because they, they like the family values in the military. Um, so, 
by the, by the time you leave the military, the chance of divorce is really high. So in fact, some of the veteran suicides would be connected to divorce, because divorce is very likely as a result of being in the military. And the association between divorce and suicide is a much higher one. A divorced man is nine times more likely to suicide than a divorced woman. Anyway, yes, I don't, I'm not speaking of anti feminists, I'm talking of MRAs, and MRAs do talk about the suicide issue all the time. It's, it's not all about the family bashing. And if, and if there is people, if I'm on a web, if I'm on a, I, I, I admin a Facebook group, um, that's a Ben's Rights Facebook group, and sometimes you'll get people there that are, clearly don't care about men's rights. And that is one of the things that I'll say to them. If, if you just hear the family bashing, fuck up elsewhere, go, go to, go to my feminist side. I'm, I'm, I, for me, it's not all about the family bashing. But oppressing your oppressor doesn't end oppression. They just say, Andrew Dworkin said kill all men. I think Andrew Dworkin was dead by the time the kill all men thing happened. I don't know why you're saying that. It was, uh, Baha Mustafa who was, um, posting the kill all men tweets. Um, she's a diversity officer at uh, Goldsmiths University in London. I mean, she wasn't the only one, but she was the one that made the news. Wasn't she? I don't know why you're saying Andrew Jordan did that. Andrew did that. Still not. It's like, well, you know, nothing about feminism. It just makes these anti feminists seem like they're scared of trash talk. Or it's just trash talk. Because she thinks that the only men affected by all this negative talk about men are fully grown men with life experience who've uh, been through the school of rough knocks and all that. She doesn't think about the boys. She doesn't think, think about how this affects boys who haven't even gone through puberty yet and they're already hearing that men are terrible. Not just trash talk for them. Boys are stupid for rocks of them. T-shirts that say "Boys are stupid for rocks them." They're displayed in the windows of shops. I've seen them in the windows of shops. I don't have to draw attention to them, do I? I don't think the people selling the T-shirts could be drawing attention to them, saying, "Buy this. This T-shirt is really funny. It's really funny because it recommends violence to all the boys and says they're stupid. That's really funny, isn't it?" Yeah. Yeah, that's really funny. As long as you don't, you know, you're not a boy and you already think you're stupid. And you already are a victim of violence. Or like, they can't really make a sound argument. But it also puts the world on notice that a great way to troll an anti-feminist is to just repeat the things they don't like because it drives them crazy. I was reminded actually when I was a teenager, this was sort of like the sort of thing I was told was, if you ignore them, they'll stop it. They don't stop it because you ignore them. It doesn't work to just ignore them and they'll stop it. They're not going to stop it because we ignore them. You've never escalated. I don't know what you're trying to say. You're trying to say that the behaviour of the radical feminists is our fault. That, that we make them behave that way. If you're one of those kind of feminists that uses rhetoric to shut down conversations, I might be give you a taste of your medicine term and I say, isn't that victim blaming? I don't have any issue with opposition to sex negative regressive gender politics. I object to cheesy tactics and personal attacks no matter how right someone thinks they are. I can't work with someone with an inherently negative mindset and I can't have a constructive dialogue with someone whose followers call me names related to lady parts in a chat, web forum, or private conversations. People like that don't want to talk. They want blood. It isn't enough to criticize people. For progress to happen, we need to offer viable alternatives. Do nothing, things are fine, is not a viable alternative because the only constant is change. In tune there. Do nothing, everything's fine, is not a viable alternative. Do nothing, everything is fine, is not a viable alternative. But at the same time, you shouldn't focus on what you oppose. So, if you don't focus on what we oppose, then we're pretending everything's fine, aren't we? 
but you said that wasn't a viable alternative. So I can't say everything's fine, but I can't focus on what I oppose. What is it, Liana? Those two suggestions are contradictory. So I'm to establish that, that not everything's fine, but at the same time, not to focus on what I oppose. What is it? Keep, keep what I oppose just out of the corner of my eye. Online culture is fixated on criticism, and that's become an impediment to action. But it's easy to criticize instead of putting in the work. The implication when you go, oh, it's easy to criticize. The implication is that feminism has been a movement for positive thinking from the start. And that all feminists have ever done is praise the bits of society they like. And they've never criticized bits of society they don't like. I've written entire books on how it's great to be a woman. <laughs> <laughs> what I like about being a woman. They've never done that. <laughs> it's all been criticism, hasn't it? It's been pretty much all been criticism. The whole movement is a movement based on criticism. Let's keep going. It's easier and quicker to tear things down instead of building things up. I think many anti-feminists are actually good people who just have bad activist habits. Yes, there are some who have ill intents, but I need to believe they're the minority, because otherwise, yikes. Feminism is the same way. Most people are well-meaning, a minority are predators. I actually believe that most feminists are well-meaning. That probably runs against the narrative, though, doesn't it? But I do think they are well-meaning. They just have a flawed model. That flawed model means they interpret things in ungenerous ways that makes them hateful. They're led to hate by a well-meaning path. Let's put it that way. And I'm tired of outside forces giving the predators more power. If you wonder why certain personalities end up on talk shows, it's because you put them there through a wave of outrage and controversy. The rest of us desperately need your help to get our alternative viewpoints out. But you're too busy raising the Q score of a person you despise. Is it just me, or did that sound an awful lot like she was asking for somebody to harass her so she could use it as an excuse for getting onto a chat show? <laughs> I'm sure that's not what she meant. That is what I was it like. Um, well, you can now. Hannah Wallen's called you a retard. Please continue with that. I'm also thinking that maybe you need a little bit of harassment to get back in with the feminists that have excommunicated you. You go, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I didn't realise, I've been a fool. I trusted them and now they've turned against me. Yeah, we turned against you because... We turned against you because you pretended you wanted to understand us, and then you just... mocked every attempt we made to respond to your quest for insight. Yeah, I had to re-edit this bit. There's a much more jokey little bit I had in here before. Much more friendly. I'm trusting you now. Ask yourself, do you want to be angry or do you want to be productive? Where are your solutions? Where are your suggestions? How are you helping? Or are you just tearing people down? Free speech includes people you can't stand. But free speech doesn't mean you have to give them attention. If you can't say a single positive thing about someone you oppose, your perspective is faulty. At the very least, these people you hate are very good at media relations and credit where credit is due. If you're Again, they're very good at media relations. They're very good at no platforming. They're very good at closing down lectures. They've echo getted us. That's what they've done. It's not they're echo chambering themselves. No, they've echo ghettoed us. They have turned us into pariahs so that we don't get our message out. I don't mean really, we're the ones that need to be told to respect free speech, Liana. Seriously. We're not the ones that need to be told to respect other people's rights of free speech. As I say, I don't particularly want to stop them saying kill all men, because the more they say kill all men, the more obvious it is they're a hate movement, which is part of what I'm trying to say. If you're attacking ideas, not people, then there's no need to feel hate. This is very paradoxical, isn't it? 
don't criticize the individuals, criticize the ideas. Okay. Yeah. The idea is feminism. When I criticize that, I get told, not all feminists, okay. All right, specifically, he's always, don't criticize the individual. Oh, for God's sake. Um, it's quite right. It's feminism again, it's not feminists. People with bad ideas are not necessarily bad people. But they've got bad ideas. I'm not allowed to talk about a bad idea. They always say no. In order to be effective, you have to approach these problems through a place of inner strength. It's important to keep in mind that you probably don't personally know these people, so you can't like or dislike them as people. If you still feel that burning hatred, that says a lot more about you than it does about them. I say this as someone who's utterly despised by large portions of the internet, and I don't recognize the person they claim I am. I'm trying to work out why the, um, the Sarkeesian and the Macintoshes and all that lot hate you. Because you stood up for the guys that they decided was going to be the villains in their story they broke their narrative. That's why they hate you. Do you understand that? Surely. Um, you're not alone, Liana. This is how they treated Katie Rife too. Katie Rife had hate mail. It was loathed amongst the sort of mainstream feminism. Bill Parley is loathed. Christine Half Summers is loathed. Evan Pizzy is loathed. Every feminist that's ever stood up. For men, or boys, I know you stood up for boys. You stood up for men that seemed really vulnerable to you. And you stood up for them because they were geeks. I mean, in fact, yeah. In fact, it's the same way as the black feminists in um, during the second wave. The second wave had a problem with the black feminists because the black feminists would say, well, hold on, I've got to fight for the rights of blacks as well. And if you keep only attacking the black men, then that that puts me in two. That, that that puts me in two different directions. I don't know what to do. Should I be sticking up for the black man because I'm black, or should I be against him because I'm a woman? And that confused them. And for that reason, they didn't see themselves to be part of the feminist movement as a whole. I think you did the same thing because you were a geek feminist, and you know, somehow geek power. Yeah, you. Wanted to wave your geek flag, and uh, you had a crisis, you had a crisis of loyalties. Did you want to fight for women's rights, or did you want to fight for geek rights? Um, you realised they were attacking somebody that you saw as vulnerable. That's why I appealed to you, Liana. You see that all men are vulnerable. I know that's hard. Because most men don't want to admit they're vulnerable. Because we know we lose status by admitting we're vulnerable. I speak to my sons today, well not today, yesterday. I speak to my sons yesterday about um, when was Superman himself? Was he Superman himself when he was Clark Kent? Was he Superman himself when he was Superman? And he said, I think he's, he's, he's himself when he's Clark Kent and at home <laughs> so there's no one watching because he's got to perform as both Clark Kent and Superman and interestingly enough Batman he said was, was himself when he was in his cave not when he's out being Batman and not when he's being Bruce Wayne but when he's being Batman in his cave basically his idea was that we only get to be ourselves when in complete solitude. But I said, that's interesting, isn't it? Because that's supposed to be the disguise. Batman's supposed to be the disguise. And Clark Kent's the disguise. So even though they're alone, they're in their disguise. <laughs> Both cases. 
You had him in the Batcave in his disguise. And then you had Superman at home in his disguise. That's strange that that's the, that's the real one. Yeah, it's a big question about Superman and Clark Kent. Which one's the real one? I remember asking this actually. I asked this of somebody. Um, God, I was so so precocious actually. I was at university. I was back at university. I said to the I said to a girl. Um, that I was. I don't know if it was before we were dating or not. I said to her, "Do you think Clark Kent ever feels jealous of Superman?" How can we feel jealous of the same person? Yes, yeah, but Lois Lane loves Superman. Just doesn't love Clark Kent. It doesn't matter the same man. He has to keep being Superman just so he keeps loving him. Anyway, men don't admit to their vulnerability, which makes it hard for you to see their vulnerability. But you can't just see the geeks as vulnerable. We're all vulnerable. And, uh, yeah, you defended the geeks because you saw they were vulnerable. You know they were vulnerable because you know what it is to be a geek. So do I. They do that to all men. It's not just the geeks. Oh yeah, so that's how they hate you. They hate you if you're stuck up for the men. And they can't see any vulnerability in any men. They can't see vulnerability in any men. And because of that, they thought they could have a go at some men you could see vulnerability in. Because you knew where their vulnerability came from. Because it's the same vulnerability you have. So in that way, you're a bit like the black feminists in the, uh, during the second wave. So what's the solution? Do we have a new form of intersectionalism where we have put nerds in there so that's an intersection as well? And then we're just making another smaller minority that we can all have a go at. I think we just got to drop this whole model and start seeing every single person as a complex human being and stop trying to find villains and victims. I can only assume they're just mirroring a piece of themselves. So my challenge to anti-feminists who watch this channel and who follow me on various social media is to tell me, what are you for? What change do you want to bring to the world? Or are you just really angry? Well, actually, it took me pretty much all the video to try and work out what you were really asking for. And I was genuinely confused when you were talking all about radical feminists. Um, and I thought, this is supposed to be a rant against anti-feminists. And you seem to be ranting about what radical feminists do. And I was genuinely confused. Um, and then I went out for a bit. I was going to the shops. And... I was pondering what was going on. And actually, I think I hope I've answered your question. I mean, that final question. What am I for? I told you. I'm for compassion for men and boys. That's what I'm for. I'm for increased compassion for men and boys. And rights as well. But I think the rights will come about as a result of compassion. I think compassion is the thing to work on first. To do that, we need to stop seeing people as heroes and villains and victims and start seeing people as um, fully holistic human beings. Which is what I talk about. Yeah, I'm opposed to patriarchy theory. I think it makes us see men as villains. And makes us see women as victims. It makes women see themselves as victims. And actually it also makes men see themselves as villains. And it sets men against each other. Because men see themselves as one-offs. As heroes amongst um, a bad lot of them. So it turns men against each other, which um, means that men have less support as brothers. That's what I'm for, to be honest. Um, but it is kind of awkward because I'm a men's rights activist. I'm not just an anti feminist. So um, your rant was really at anti feminists. I was a bit offended when you referred to as so-called men's rights activists. We are men's rights activists. I think more than just men's rights activists. But um, we certainly, and some of what we do, is about rights.
don't think you can blame us for the attention given to radical feminists. I mean, you blame the media. Whilst I'm against patriarchy theory, and I kind of think patriarchy theory is probably definitive of feminist, if you can probably say to me that no, it's not true, that, that it is possible to be an advocate for women's rights, which, which it is, clearly, it's, it's possible to be an advocate for women's rights without believing in patriarchy theory. Um, then yes, maybe we might be allies. From the point of view, at least incidentally, allies. I don't think that necessarily means we work together. But I think it might mean we might have to work in opposition with each other to negotiate what both sides feel comfortable with. However, I think that dialogue is important. Feminists don't respect us. Feminists don't really understand us. They think we're trying to turn the clock back. Historically, its feminists have been more inimical to men's rights than men's rights have been to feminists. Um, Warren Fowler is in, in the myth of male power and um, in the book Proceeding, um, where men are the way they are. And even Robert Bly, from the myth of poetic movement, which is pretty much non existent now. Um, they were both non antagonistic towards feminism, but feminism was antagonistic towards them. Um, my experiences of trying to talk about men's issues was that if you tried to do it under feminist supervision, you couldn't, because there were certain things you couldn't talk about, and certain things you couldn't question, but I felt needed to question them. I also think that feminism quite often reinforces traditional gender roles. And it probably reinforces those traditional gender roles that um, women are uncomfortable about challenging. So the thing is, if, if you make it that society has been devised by men for the benefit of men, then that's the only conclusion you can have as to why can men feasibly have any kind of rights issue or disadvantages in society, they must be doing it to themselves. Well, that's not the case. And we all contribute to society. We've all made a contribution to civilization. We've just made con contributions in different spheres. Um, men, perhaps in the political sphere, and women in the domestic sphere, although even that is a generalization, because, of course, um, there have been female monarchs throughout history. I can't talk for all anti-feminists. I, I don't even really identify as an anti-feminist. Although I don't know. But you might identify me as an anti-feminist. You might, you might consider me to be an anti-feminist. Um, because I'm not a feminist. But, you know, it's like the difference between being an atheist. I would describe myself as an atheist. I wouldn't describe myself as an anti-Christian. But I don't agree with anything that the Christians believe in. Um, that doesn't mean that every deed that comes out of Christian belief needs to be a deed that I disagree with. So whilst I may not agree with your theoretical model, then it's quite possible that you might wind up doing the right things for the wrong reasons, as it were. So um, I'm not antagonistic towards individuals just because your belief system is different from mine. But your belief system is different from mine. Yeah, so I realised that the whole ranting about radical feminists was you demonstrating how to criticise feminists constructively. Don't worry, we've been doing that. We've been doing that for years. All the memes that just take the mick out of them is just for shits and giggles. We do deconstruct them intelligently as well, as I hope I've demonstrated. Now, I don't know who you've encountered that has been, has just been triggered by the fact that you're a feminist. And that's what it is. I, I think I said this in one of your, um, I said this in one of your comments, Fred, on one of your things about, is it a microaggression or is it, um, macro sensitivity? People say, oh, that triggered me. They're actually right. That is a triggering. 
no, not necessarily PTSD, but it's similar. It's, it's the same effect. The thing is, it's it's you see something that you associate with a negative experience you've had in the past, and you think you're going to have that negative experience all over again because you've seen that thing, and it means you react re irrationally to that thing that triggers you. So people say, "Oh, I've been triggered." That shouldn't be an accusation. That should be an apology. You just go, "Oh, that um, I'm sorry. I was triggered by that thing." Um, but I've obviously misjudged the situation. I've misjudged that situation because I had a bad experience in my past in which something similar happened, and I've come to associate that thing with a bad thing had been about to happen. My apologies. I've acted un irrationally. I've acted unreasonably. Um, and that sometimes happens. Sometimes somebody says they're a feminist, and, you know, we've had bad experiences with feminists. We've all had bad experiences with feminists. So naturally, we distrust anyone that says they're a feminist. Um, I, yeah, I think that's probably the same way you feel about anti-feminists. Um, or people that are critical of feminism. Or people that say that they're not a feminist. So, I understand that. Yeah. If you say you're a feminist, some of us get triggered. <laughs> Because we've all had bad experiences of feminists. But it is important that we have dialogue. And it's important that no one, no platform is the other. Safe spaces and echo chambers and censorship in general. It's eumemics. I'm going to invent the word eumemics. I'll stick it up. So I do and invent new words. I think about eumemics. Um, because we know what eugenics is, right? That's when you kind of like, Think that you can manipulate the gene pool by getting rid of certain genes, and I'm against eugenics because we we could get rid of something and by underappreciating its value, we get rid of something we think is a negative trait without realizing how valuable it was. We say we got rid of autism, and as a result, of getting rid of autism, we had no geniuses. That would be a shame, wouldn't it? It'd be a shame to have a human race without any geniuses. Just we thought, oh, autism's a bad thing, let's get rid of it. I'm against eugenics for that reason, because I don't trust human beings to know the value of things until it's too late, until it's gone. And I think the same way about censorship. But censorship's eumemics. It's going, those are undesirable ideas, let's get rid of those. Let's get rid of those. Good. And it might turn out they have a value that we had underestimated. So, hmm, in the words of Stephen Hawking in the division bell, all we need to do is make sure we keep talking. So, alternative conclusion. Okay. So, my first conclusion was generous. Because I was assuming that she was genuinely asking me what I wanted. I took her request at face value. But now I'm looking at it again. She's saying, well, don't focus. What's, what she's talking about is feminism. Right? She's talking about our attitude to feminism. So, she said, well, rather than talking about the bits of feminism you don't like, to what the bits of feminism you do like. So, it's kind of going, well, what bits of advocacy for women's rights are you interested in? Well, actually, there are a few. Okay, I'll come to that. All right, I'll, I'll deal with that in a moment. I will answer that question in a moment. I'll have a think about it while I'm making tea. I'll come to that question in a moment. But firstly, how bloody self-centred. How bloody self-centered. It's not all about you. You see, that's the thing. You're brought up from a very early age thinking it's all about you. You think you're princesses. You're saying, oh, women's rights have been held back for a hundred years. I mean, a hundred years trying to be able to... No, you actually achieved most of your goals that were about advancing women's rights. The ones that really faced opposition were the ones that may have given men rights too. Shared custody, that was blocked. That was one of the reasons why the ERA was blocked. You said that yourself. That's why certain feminists and village Lappy rose up against the feminist movement. You struggled to get the sensing gap straightened out. And yeah, I, I know that there were feminists in the 60s that were saying that the fact that women got lighter sentences was an example of male chauvinism. 
But by the 80s, there were feminists trying to get women off murder cases with the said she had PMT. Now, I know there were feminists that opposed that. I remember reading an, an article by a feminist that said, this is ridiculous, um, this makes it harder for women to have high-powered jobs if, if they're considered to be so mad when they have female attention that they'll be murderous. Um, and she made a very good argument why this was a silly thing. But nevertheless, the people that were supporting the idea that women should be given lighter sentences if they acted on PMT were also feminists. Because feminists are just women's rights advocates. That's all you are. Apart from this theory that you've got that's wrong. The theory that you've based everything on, which is wrong. We really need to talk about that. I'll tell you what, we really need to talk about that because of your obsession with toxic masculinity. Because you don't know where masculinity comes from. You think masculinity comes from privilege. You think masculinity comes from being pampered. I mean, seriously. I have seen articles by feminists claiming that men are pampered into their masculinity. No. Masculinity is forged in adversity. That's why we don't protect boys' self-esteem the way we protect girls' self-esteem. Because we expect boys to be able to take it. And it's because we expect boys to be able to take it that they have been able to take it. To a certain extent. We just need to look at the language to know that masculinity comes from not being pampered. When somebody says, oh, this will make a man of you, they're not talking about something that's going to be a pleasant experience. They're talking about something that's going to involve you experiencing harsh conditions. When somebody talks about, it makes me feel more like a woman, they're talking about a day at the spa. Um, there's a verb, mollycoddle, which means to pamper. The mollycoddle is also a noun, and it refers to the result of mollycoddling, which is an effeminate man. Right? So, mollycoddle refers to effeminacy. Being mollycoddled makes you feminine. Adversity makes you masculine. Another thing I notice as an actor is as I'm changing class, my character, the more working class I am, the more masculine I am. And the more posh I am, more feminine I am. See? And that's true of men and women. It's true of both genders. You notice uh, working class girls working on the market can be a bit butcher than your uh, upper class girls. Um, so the idea that masculinity is associated with privilege and femininity is associated with being the underdog is actually the reverse of the case. So if the feminist approach to dealing with toxic masculinity is teaching men to recognise their privilege, making them feel more guilty, knocking their self-esteem even more, you're actually making them more masculine, ironically, while at the same time telling them to suppress the appearance of being masculine. You're creating basket cases. And then when they go and shoot up some school, you'll go, there it is, toxic masculinity, we're not doing enough about that. No, you're doing too much about it, that's what you're doing. Yeah, so um, you can see why when I watched that back, I went, oh no, cut that, cut that, cut that, that was terrible. Because I came across quite scary. Um, I think the anger is legitimate. Because... It's a psychological model, sociological model, psychological model, whatever. I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a sociologist. But using a sociological model that's wrong, trying to fix society based on a sociological model that's wrong, so we're identifying the problems badly, and we're causing serious damage. And the serious damage we're causing, we're attributing to the society that we think we're changing. So we're creating the society that we think we're changing and therefore making it worse. It's round and round and round the circle. It's a vicious circle. 
And the only way out of it is to have an alternative view expressed, and the alternative view has been silenced. It's quite just to be angry under those circumstances. So just to uh, defend myself, let's see what a man who does believe in patriarchy theory looks like. The fuck up! I mean it. If you identify as a men's rights activist, I am not wasting any time engaging with you. I am just going to have fun and get it out of my system and entertain my actual audience by pointing out what a bunch of pathetic fucking losers you are. <laughs> yeah, I feel better now. Yeah. Ah, oh, I'd be angry white right men. All right, in terms of women's rights, I think girls need heroes too. And I'm very keen for um, girls to have hero characters too. Um, I'm very much against princess culture. I prefer my daughter to have um, heroes like Ray. And... Um, Heroes like Toriel, rather than rather than heroes like um, rather than Disney princess heroes. I'd rather have my daughter have active heroes than um, passive heroines that expect to be rescued. When I've said, actually. We shouldn't be seeing women as victims. I'm against women being seen as victims. And that's something to do with women's rights. Um, I don't know if you probably won't watch, I very much doubt you're going to watch this video, actually, given your lack of interest in what we're actually about. I've talked before about hyper agency and hypo agency. Now, in fact, this is something that I think if you've got an audience that were half feminists and half Men's rights activists. They had the audience bit number two. They don't know. They don't know what speaker they're getting. Um, so they don't realise that. They only realise when they come in that the other half of the audience all MRAs. And the MRAs don't realise until they come in the other half of feminists. They're all going, what the bloody hell are they doing here? What the bloody hell are they doing here? And I open up by saying, um, in our society, we assume that women don't have agency. The whole audience applauds. The whole audience applauds, and then suddenly they go, Hey, what? Why are they applauding? You don't know. Because you don't realise this is, this is common ground. Both, we both agree on this. We don't ascribe agency to women in our society. And uh, this has a negative effect for both men and women. Um, it has a negative effect for women like Mary Shelley, for example, who uh, really is the founder of science fiction. She's the first science fiction writer. I mean, she predates H.G. Wells and Jules Verne. Um, and she was asked, did your husband help you with that? <laughs> now, that's obviously a net downside for women of the fact that they're not ascribed agency. But then, of course, it's because we don't ascribe women agency that we think this whole society has been designed by men, which is a myth that the feminists perpetuate. The whole society was designed by men for the benefit of men. Well, no, it wasn't, because we were all brought up by our mothers. We learned culture from our mothers. You can't really say that the entirety of civilization has been created by men. So that's, again, the failure to ascribe agency to women. That actually feminism support. And the reason that the men's rights activists are going to be saying, saying, yeah, yeah, that's true, we don't ascribe agency to women, is because that's why when they're victims of domestic violence, it's assumed that somehow he made her do it. He must have provoked her. If she hasn't got agency. Now, um, when you look at hyper agency, hyper agency, um, I normally talk about melodrama. Um, 
this is melodrama. And we have the agency along here. And this way we have um, virtue versus vice. And these are two masculine roles here. Hero or villain. And uh, women tend to be down here. Victim. That's melodrama. You your damsel. You got your hero. You got your villain. And that's the way we see the world. We, um, very Victorian, really. Very Victorian way of looking at men and women. But it's a Victorian way of looking at men and women that we've inherited. What I've been advocating, not that you care. <laughs> what I've been advocating is we move away from all that. Just as that was a theatrical form that was kind of came to prominence in the 19th century, there is an earlier form, which is tragedy. And the thing about the tragic hero, you see, is he's got or she, he or she, has all three. It's a combination of all three. Rather than having hyper-agency or hypo-agency, the tragic hero has meso-agency. Right in the middle, see. I mean, they have some influence over their fate, but they're also subject to forces out of their control. So, whilst they can have flaws that causes error of judgments, that means that they can suffer more than they deserve. Um, they have an effect on their own fate. They can take responsibility for their part in whatever caused them to suffer. And from that, then gain wisdom. And because they are neither virtuous nor villainous, but in fact somewhere in between, which means they're kind of kind of virtuous. They have virtues. But they're not eminently good. They're just like you and me. Which means um, when they suffer, they feel empty for them, not sympathy. That's all victims get. Victims just get sympathy. But tragic hero, he or she gets empathy. That's what I want to do for women and men. I want women and men to both be seen as meso agents. And I want us to um, lose this notion that there are men that are villains. And a few good men must be heroes to protect the poor victim women from these villainous men. We we'll lose that way of looking at the world and get everyone seen holistically as human beings. So, um, I mean, that's my views. I, mean, I wouldn't even say that's my views as a men's rights activist, really. That's just my take on it. But as you can see, uh, men's rights activism, they have incidental advantages for women. Gloria Steinem was always saying that uh, feminism may have incidental advantages for men, and in some ways she was right. I have a much closer relationship with my children than my father had with me. A much better relationship. And maybe that was in part due to feminism. But it doesn't change the fact that feminism is based on a flawed model of society. And that flawed model is making society sicker right now, not making it better. They may have made it better once. It's a bit like going to a Freudian therapist. And we know Freud's a crackpot. Freud was a nut, really. And whenever he found something that contradicted his system, he just kind of twiddled it a bit. And um, he never, uh, so until his system was completely irrefutable. Like a, I mean, Freudian psychology is a bit like a cult in itself. But you go to a Freudian therapist, and the very fact you're talking about your problems is helping alleviate some of your symptoms, and so you think you're doing well. Eventually, he's just making you madder because he's saying crazy things to you, like, You're in love with your mother, aren't you? And you go, No. And he says, Oh, that's because you're suppressing it. You won't be well until you admit that you're in love with your mother. And uh, stuff like that. Um, 
if you're trying to heal society, but using a wrong model to do so, you wind up making society sicker. I think that's where feminism is now. It's been using the wrong model for a long time. And all the benefits that can be had from this wrong model, they've been achieved. And now the wrong model is making society sicker and sicker. And we need to change the model. And this is the point, of course, where I say, this is one blind man putting on the nature of elephants. And Liana, if you do get around to watching this, you're a blind woman. Because I think you think you're an expert in elephants. You're not an expert in elephants. You're not an expert in elephants that can educate us about elephants. You're a blind woman who are watching the nature of elephants too. You need to overcome your arrogance. Because you can be arrogant right now. And other opinions are available. Check them out sometime. Cheerio.